really appreciate the uh, opportunity just to be here. Uh, it's a huge blessing and honor. Uh, I want to just start us out in prayer real quick, if you guys don't mind. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for so much for this day. Thank you for everything you've done for us, just for the opportunity to come here and worship you and, and just lift your name up. God, open our hearts to receive your word and just what you have for us. Uh, speak to each one of us. God, let us not leave unchanged, uh, but just work in our hearts and make us who you want us to be. And we pray. Amen. You guys hear me okay? Okay, cool. So, um, Nick called me a little while back and asked me about speaking, and, and I was like, okay, that's, that's cool. I, you know, I wouldn't mind doing that. I uh, had only shared my story one other time at my, my church, at the youth service before, and they gave me like 10 to 15 minutes, which is a lot to recap your life, you know, like everything that's happened. I'm 34 years old. Um, so, but that was, that was interesting. And so I said, sure. And then, uh, he called me back. He's like, yeah, Nikki just reminded me that's Father's Day. I was like, oh, okay, but that's, that's good. I don't have kids. So I'm going to tell you guys, not have kids. Um, but I still think what I've experienced, what I've lived through and where God's brought me from, um, one, my dad was a huge impact on me. And I'm going to talk about that. Um, and just kind of starting to see God more as a father too. Um, it's kind of where he's taken me. And so, uh, for those of you guys that, that have kids, that's great. If you don't have kids, um, you know, you still be able to relate and kind of connect to this. Um, but I'm going to just start in high school because skip all the middle school awkward stuff and uh, go to the awkward high school stuff. So I, I've known Nick since fifth grade. And uh, in fact, you'll see a picture there. It's a very stylish uh, jumpsuit that he's got on. And um, I'm a big fan of the stonewash jeans, still am, you know. So no, I'm kidding. But uh, so that was back in our Southgate days in uh, 10th grade, actually, and it was cool. Me and Nick played on the same, you know, basketball team, played soccer together, a lot of the sports we played together. Um, in one game, we actually had half the point, actually, we had the entire team's points was between me and Nick. That was only five, but, you know, we were responsible for the first two quarters of play. It was pretty awesome, so uh, anyway, but grew up in Christian school. I, um, since elementary all the way through high school, I uh, went to Victory most of my life, went to Southgate, was blessed to go there for a year, um, had a great time, and so kind of grew up around uh, just the church and school, and, and I knew, I received Jesus Christ when I was five, I was actually very young, but again, I, I grew up in that, and so I asked him to come to my heart and save me when I was five, and um, the whole high school was just kind of a journey of just saw things probably a little bit different than what a lot of you guys may have seen, just because I was around church, church school, just a di different kind of atmosphere than growing up in public school. Um, I think there's pros and cons to both, but, but God was kind of working on me from there. Um, my dad, as I mentioned, was a huge influence on me. He taught me at a very young age to actually read the Bible. Um, I was reading Proverbs when I was probably seven, eight years old, um, you know, what I could, a few verses here and there. He taught me really quick, there's 31 chapters in Proverbs, and there's 31 days typically in a month, so, um, you know, whatever day you're on, that's the, the chapter that you can read to kind of connect with Christ, so it was really cool. Um, and you can go to the next, there you go. So that, that's my dad there. It was him in the Navy. Um, he was born in 1947, and he actually passed away in 2003 with Lou Gehrig's disease. Have you guys heard of Lou Gehrig's disease? Anybody heard of it? Okay. So it, what it is, it's a, it's a, they don't know how it came about. They don't know what started it. They don't know how to cure it. Uh, but it kills the motor neurons in your body that keep your muscles alive. So eventually your muscles just break down and they die. Um, so my senior year of high school, First day, senior year, my mom sits down with me on the bed, and she says, um, you know, Josh, uh, your dad, uh, you know, we, he's been having some issues with his arm, and, and just, we didn't know what was going on, and the tests are confirmed, we, you know, we've had a, a second test done, and he has ALS, he has Lou Gehrig's disease, and I, I didn't even know what that was, and so she told me, you know, that basically what it was, and that this was just going to be a process, and that, you know, he eventually would pass away. Um, obviously, I was just crushed. Uh, my dad taught me everything. I mean, he taught me how to change the oil in the car, how to change tires. Um, he played golf with me, went fishing with me. I mean, he was, he was just an awesome dad. He, he preached in the jails on Sunday morning. Um, before I was born, he actually pastored a church for a little while, but just always involved in ministry. Um, and throughout that, that time, he was sick for about three and a half, four years. Um, you know, I watched him reach out to Christ, even in his sickness. And uh, I was just amazed. It was you know, he set the precedent for what I feel like a dad should be. You know, he made me, he inspired me to want to be that kind of dad one day. And I'm definitely looking forward to having kids. I've kind of been wanting kids for about five years now. Uh, and just different things have happened, five or six years, and just haven't been able to get to that point in my life. But um, he, he set 
what it should be. In fact, I'll never forget, he's like, Josh, I want to go back to the jail just one more time. And so I, um, I got, him, got him loaded up in the van, and uh, he had his little wheelchair, and he had his Bible across his lap, and I remember watching him go through those doors, but they wouldn't even let me in. They, they opened the cell block and said, you know, it's, it's all him, and there's no, there's no bars, and it was just between him and him and the prisoners, and, um, and six people received Christ that day, and that was the last time that he, he gave the gospel, and he was just, you know, he'd be on his keyboard just typing away, just telling his cousins about Jesus, and um, just, it was just so cool to see him so humble and so passionate and so fired up about, you know, about God, and some people would get mad at God and say, well, why did this happen to such a good person, and, you know, all these different things, and he just took it as just, it was just a, something that God had for him, you know, God uses everything to his glory, and, um, and he used my dad, and he used that sickness to go through that. Um, about, about that time, really the last year of my dad's sickness, um, I got married. I, I met this girl named Heather in high school. We dated three and a half years. Um, got married in 2001. And uh, that first year of marriage was pretty tough because I was taking care of my dad, who was pretty much, you know, I was going home at night, helping my mom sometimes get him in bed and things like that. And so that was, that was a difficult, trying time. Um, but then, for the most part, had a, a fairly happy marriage for 11 years. Um, and you can, Gavin, you can go to the next slide. So that's Heather there. That was taken in 2011. Um, you know, and most people saw us as just like the perfect couple. You know, we high school sweethearts. We grew up together. Um, you know, we served together, went to church together. Um, it seemed like, you know, people, people were trying to model their marriages after ours. They thought that we got it. Um, but we didn't. Neither one of us got it. Neither one of us really understood what it means to put each other first and love Christ, or love each other the way Christ loves the church, and just to be submissive to his will. We, um, we both had our own issues, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to take it from the standpoint of what I did wrong and what God taught me through that. I, um, I had a pride issue. I had attention issue. Um, you know, I liked the attention of girls, even though I was married. I don't know if it's because I got married at a young age. I don't know if it was something about me as I was growing up. I don't know if it's just how God made me, but attention was a big thing for me. And so if it was, you know, texting one of her friends or if it was flirting or whatever it might be, you know, there were some things there that, that had to do with pride and sin in my life that, that caused some emotional damage to her that she didn't feel like she could make, make it through. And so we separated in May 2012. The kid thing was, was also an issue. At that point, she had been through a lot of school and just was not ready to have kids yet. And it was just kind of a conflict as well. Um, we separated in May, and then the divorce was final um, in fall of 2013. So, but this is what God did in my life as far as the transformation. I just want to go, you can go to the next slide, Gavin. Thanks. So, what happened was, again, I had pride, I had sin, and it separated me from really knowing Christ the way I should know him, and I just didn't have a, I didn't, ca it, he didn't captivate me like he should have. He wasn't that important, and, and he should have been. Um, so, my struggle with pride continued till about August 2012, because during the separation, I'm like, oh, you know, she's... She's got it so good. Like, I got a good job. We travel. I mean, the year before, we had went to the, um, the Bahamas. No, I'm sorry, Bermuda. We went to Bermuda, like an all-inclusive for a week. That one at work. We had went to Jamaica. Just, just paid for that. Went to Jamaica. I mean, all these trips, you know. Like, we just had a really cool life. And I'm like, why would she leave that, you know? Um, so about August is when I, it just started to really hit me. And I said, <laughs> be careful what you pray to God because he will answer you. And you may not like what, what he tells you. But I said, God, I said, just open up my heart and show me what you want me to change, God. Expect him to be like, gosh, you're good. Like, don't, just, you know, you're good, you're good. But, uh, you know, so I prayed that, and, and he just opened the floodgate. You know, he said, you know, you've got pride. Um, you know, you're consumed with the next best thing, whether it's gadgets, things like that. There's just so many things you just need to simplify and just make your life about me and just and giving me praise and glory. And so I um, started just reading books after books. Um, God just really opened my heart. He made me, he made me want to, um, to know him better. I want to read a verse real quick that I feel like kind of sums up a lot of what I was going through. 2 Corinthians uh, 4.17. Do we have that, Gavin? I can't remember. Um, I mean, actually, I added that later. Let me read it to you real quick. I'm sorry. That's not part of that PowerPoint slide. Um, so 2 Corinthians 4.17 says... For our present troubles are small and won't last very long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. Sometimes we think that what we're going through 
is just the absolute worst. You know, we're at rock bottom. Um, you know, whether it's a miscarriage, whether it's a spouse is wanting to leave us, whether it's um, problems with our kids, you know, just there's so many things that trials and adversities that come our way. Um, but God allows those things to happen for a reason. And they're so small and so minute compared to what God truly wants to get out of this. He, he has a glory. He has a praise that he's going to get from this that's going to be far outweigh that, that temporary trial that we go through. And I was starting to kind of understand that. I was starting to kind of, that was starting to click with me. So here's some changes that I made that, that really was instrumental. If you go to the next slide, you'll see here just a few points. Um, he wanted me to change who I hung out with. You know, for me, I just hung out with whoever we were closest with at the time. Most of them were couples. But a lot of the couples didn't really, I don't feel like they really got it, you know. And they were, I didn't even know at the time, but they were wearing on us, wearing on me. And so I had to put myself in position to be around people that, that love God and put him first. Because iron sharpens iron, Proverbs twenty seven seventeen. You guys have heard the verse. And it, it really does make a difference who you hang out with. We tell our the students, we tell college kids, but in adults, it's just, there's no difference. Um, you become who you're around. And so, you know, yeah, I hurt some people's feelings, and they didn't understand why I withdrew. But, um, you know, I just felt like I needed to be somewhere different spiritually than where I was. And the only way for me to do that is to put myself around people. Um, and some of you guys are here in this room that have had, you know, some great influence on me. And I really appreciate y'all y'all being here soon. Um, so... I began going to counseling, hated counseling. I, just the idea of it just freaked me out. And I pictured being on a couch, having a box of Kleenexes, like, you know, like, this is not me, you know? But in, in so many, God's really allowed me to be able to speak to other um, men that are having problems with marriage and just different issues, and I tell them, go to counseling. Even, even if she won't go, you go and just talk, because I'm telling you, there's just, it's so powerful. If you, again, I would, I would strongly suggest a Christian counselor. But if you can go to a Christian counselor and just talk to them about what's going on, um, that opened up my eyes to so many different things that I feel like God used that counselor and counselors to really help me. So every other week for over a year, I was going to counseling. And so this whole time, I was fighting to get Heather back. You know, I was reading marriage books. That was the other thing. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, change what I read. I, I just didn't like to read. I didn't even like to read emails. If I got an email and it was more than four lines, I was like, all right, next, you know, because I just, I wasn't a fan. But, you know, when you get broken like this, you get desperate to change. You get desperate to just soak up anything that you can get your hands on that will help your situation, help you maybe gain insight on what's going on. And I'm going to share some books at the end that I read, but I read over half a dozen marriage books in less than a year. Um, and that was that was huge for me. Usually, it would take a year to read one book. So I mean, it was just like every night it made it routine. I was going through chapters, and then I would talk to my counselor about some of the things I was reading and try to help understand those concepts of just how marriage should be done and, and what's what's the best way to go about doing it. Um, I changed what I listened to. You know, I started listening more to Christian music. That was always a part of my life, but not a huge part. Um, I also started picking up some sermons from Matt Chandler, John Piper. Andy Stanley. There's some really great apps out there. Your Move is Andy Stanley's. Um, the Village Church is Matt Chandler's. Um, John Piper's got DesiringGod.org. You can pull messages on. My job changed too. I started traveling for work, um, which was good for me because I needed to kind of be on the road and, and kind of have time to think. And so during that time, I'm covering Savannah and Hilton Head. Awful, right? <laughs> but uh, I would drive, you know, make that trip every week, and I would, I would just throw a message on, you know, Piper's about 45 minutes Stanley Smart, he keeps it about 25 um, minutes, but I, mean, I could get a couple messages in going down and coming back, and, uh, and it was just, it, it really changed my life. And so the my awakening part, and just the next slide over, we'll just show you that, you know, God wanted to do a major work in me, regardless of the outcome of my marriage. At the time, I thought I needed to change so that my marriage would be saved, but God was saying, no, you need to be changed because you need to be changed. Um, and so that's what he did in my life. Uh, our pastor, Steve Davis, over at True North, preached a message actually um, a few weeks ago that I thought summed up a lot of what I feel like I, I understood at that point and I grasped. Something that at the time I didn't even see these points coming together, but when he preached that message, I started reflecting on what God had done in my life, and I thought, you know what, that's a, that's a very good point. So let's look at those verses real quick, and if you could. So Colossians chapter 2, um, verses 6 through 15. And I'm actually going to just read it from the screen with you guys. So, and now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots go down into him, and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong, 
in the, in the truth, and you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world, rather than from Christ. For in Christ, and this is where it is, lives all the fullness of God in a human body, so that you are also complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over, the, over every ruler and authority. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but, you are, but, you are, but by a physical procedure, Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to the new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. And if you, in verse 13, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ, for he forgave all your sins. And so the three points, you can just go to the next thing here, actually 14 and 15, we can can skip over that for sake of time. Thanks. And so there's three things here that that we get from this, is ultimately in Christ we're accepted. Christ accepts us no matter what, whether you're single, married, divorced, it's complicated, you know, whatever your Facebook status says, that doesn't define you. And, and I thought that my identity was wrapped in me being married. I had this high awareness of what other people thought about me. And so more than just, you know, trying to love my wife, I felt like I had to please people. And that wasn't it at all. My identity was not wrapped up in that, but it's in how Christ has accepted me. It's that, that Christ has completed me. He's given me everything I need. Um, and, and that's one thing I'm, I'm working to try to get to that mindset. It's a difficult, complicated concept, but it's something that is, uh, is something to shoot for. And then the last thing, which is the best part, is we're forgiven. Um, if you haven't received Christ as your personal Savior, I really want to strongly encourage you to, to get with someone and talk with someone about that today, because ultimately, that's everything. Knowing that He's forgiven us, no matter where we've been, what we've done, um, there's no depth, you know, too low that He can't pull us out of. And I know it seems overwhelming. It seems like you see other people. Um, you may even see me on the stage. It's, you know, I'm, I'm nothing. I have so many flaws, and there's so many things I'm still working on. Um, but everyone is, is, is within God's reach, and he can grasp and, and pull you out of that. And then the other part of my awakening was Matthew 6, 33. This was, this was one of my life verses growing up. But what's weird is I loved it, but I didn't understand it as well as I do now after what I went through. And so Matthew 6, 33 says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. He will give you everything you need. In my mind, I was like, all right, I'm going to put God first. He's going to give me this sweet car. I'm going to have this awesome house. Probably be like a golf membership, you know. Like that, that was what I thought he was going to bring me. But then going through all this, it's seeking him, and he'll give you the fullness, the joy, the peace that money can't buy, that things can't buy, that even a relationship cannot provide for you. Christ gives you that, and he gives you that fullness inside and then the last verse, and this is my hope for the future, is Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster. To give you a future and a hope. My hope is in Christ. Before it was in me, or it was in what I accomplished, or maybe even my marriage. Um, it was in success. Now my hope is in Christ and what he has for me. You know, I don't, I don't know what the road ahead looks like. I don't know if kids or in my future. I hope so. I I still have that desire in my heart. But whatever it is, I feel like if I'm in God's will, that's where that fullness and that happiness is going to come in. Um, And that's, that's it. I know it's kind of quick, but that's, that's kind of where I'm at now. I'm I'm still on this journey and uh, still seeking God's will in a lot of different directions in my life. And uh, so if you guys will continue to pray for me, I appreciate you taking some time to to let me speak with you. Um, I will say this, on this last slide is some of the, the books that I've read over the last year. And Wild at Heart is a great book. The marriage ones, Marriage on the Rock, Love Must Be Tough, His Needs, Her Needs, Date Your Wife, Five Love Languages, and Love and Respect. Those are some of the most impactful marriages books that not only I've read, but I've even heard others say that just they're so powerful. Um, Just the conflict resolution, you know, doing marriage the right way, putting God first, that draws you closer together as a couple. Um, I never really understood. I've heard that, but I never really understood it until I read some of these books. Um, personally, Desiring God, and then most recently, Crazy Love, had just finished. Crazy Love has never, I've never read a book that convicted me so personally like Crazy Love does. Francis Chan is the author out on the West Coast. He was a pastor of a, just a massive, massive church. I want to say that we're running 10, 12,000, I think, a weekend. He stepped down from that because he felt like it had become too much about him. 
So, you know, the wealth, the power, the fame, it was just, it wasn't what he wanted. And so he stepped away from that. That church is still up and running, but it's not about him anymore. And so he's doing, he's authoring, and he's speaking. Um, and I just don't know of anybody else that really, really, I feel like, gets it like he does. He's on a whole nother level. And this book challenges me just to not even get to his level, but just to get a little bit closer to where, like, God is it, you know? And I'm just, I'm passionately in love with Christ and with God because I want to be, not out of guilt, not out of religion, not out of, you know, what, the way I was raised, but just because I love God. And it's just a really strong book, and I think you guys have a copy of it out there, too, so I definitely pick that up. But um, I'm going to pray us out, and then I'll we'll praise and worship, man, I guess, sing some. So. Help me, Father, thank you so much, God, just for all you've done and all you're doing here in New Passion, God. Um, thank you for the opportunity you've given me, and I pray that you spoke through me and that someone would receive uh, just some type of words of encouragement that might help change them. Uh, thank you for what you're going to do. Uh, God, thank you for fathers. Thank you for being our father. Thank you for the dads that are here in this room, God. Just uh, continue to just bless them, God, and just help them to be a light and just um, a shining, glowing light in this dark world and just to be the best dad that they can be. And I thank you for all you've done, all you're going to do. In your name I pray. Amen.